is given by uh, Sandy Rani, and she will talk about uh, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. All right, well, let a few more people. All right, thank you for coming today, um, and thank you for inviting me, Dorit. It's nice to be here. Um, just in terms of organization, I pulled some of my slides from tomorrow's talk and stuck them at the end, and so I'll just talk until we run out of time, and then I'll pick up tomorrow where we left off. Um, all right, so uh, while people are trickling in, we'll have a little review of yesterday's notation, so a nice, nice gentle warm-up. Um, so we're considering a quantum system sitting inside an n-dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And uh, we can imagine an orthonormal basis of our Hilbert space here, v0 through vn minus 1. And um, any state inside this space can be expressed as a superposition of in this vector, in this basis. And once you and I agree together on a basis of representation, then we can do away with the vectors and just represent our state as this column vector here. Okay, so once we have sort of understood that there's going to be an underlying um, basis that we're talking about, more often than not, that underlying basis is what we call the standard basis. So if we're talking about little n qubits, the size of the uh, Hilbert space is 2 to the n, and my standard basis is just all n bit strings. Okay, so most of the time when we don't talk about, say, a specific basis, that's the one we're talking about. Okay, and just a little review of the Dirac notation. Let's say I have two states here. Uh, I can take the, um, the, the bra version of the cat, which is just the adjoint. I take the transpose, transpose conjugate, and I get this column vector. The inner product is just now matrix multiplication, okay? So I'm multiplying this row by this column, and I get a scalar out. And the nice thing about the Dirac notation is that the value that I get, the inner product, is independent of the particular basis that we chose. So it's a nice way of sort of referring to states without having to get too specific about our underlying basis. OK, so a basic postulate of quantum mechanics says that any observable, any observable entity, anything I can measure in my system, energy, momentum, what have you, corresponds to a Hermitian operator. Hermitian just means that the, the eigenvalues of my operator are real. Okay? So what does that mean? What's this operator and what does it represent? Well, if I measure this entity, let's say I measure the e energy, the outcome has to be one of n distinct values. And I'm going to assume non-degeneracy here just to keep it simple. Okay? So I'm going to assume that these lambdas are all distinct, and I have uh, the number is equal to the dimension of my underlying Hilbert space. So there's only n possible outcomes from this measurement. And then if I get a particular outcome, I know exactly what state I'm in afterwards. I have to be in a state that's consistent with that outcome. Okay, so each possible outcome is associated with a state that I would be in after getting that measurement. So if I measure energy and I get lambda 1, I know that my current state is V1. Okay, and these, these Vs form an orthonormal basis. Okay, so the Hermitian operator associated with that measurable, let's say it's energy, that's what we're going to be talking about mostly today, is an operator, is the Hermitian operator that has eigenvalues, lambda 0 through lambda n minus 1, and corresponding eigenvectors v0 through vn minus 1, okay? So translating this into our uh, Dirac notation, um, if I reverse the order of my, um, if of my states and I take this outer bracket notation, I get a column vector times a row vector, which results in a matrix. So that's an operator. And the operator is just the projector onto V. So if I have some, if I apply my operator to some arbitrary state, it's the projection of the state onto, um, in the direction of V, okay? And up to degeneracies, 
A is the unique matrix whose eigenvalues are the lambdas and whose eigenvectors are the v's. Okay? So this is what I mean when I associate an operator with a particular entity that I'm going to measure. Um, and in the case where it is degenerate, instead of this rank one projector, I have a projector onto the ground space associated with a particular eigenvalue. Okay? Okay. Measurement continued. So suppose I have some state and I want to measure the operator A. So I'm, I have some state, I want to say measure the, the energy of my state. If my state happens to be one of these eigenvectors, then I get the outcome of my measurement is the corresponding eigenvalue with probability one. Okay? In general, my state is not necessarily one of these eigenvectors, but a superposition of these eigenvectors. And so when I measure, I'm going to get a probability distribution over outcomes. Okay? And I'm interested in what's the expected value of that measurement. Okay? So um, the probability of getting a particular outcome lambda is just um, the magnitude squared of the amplitude corresponded to that eigenvector. So it's the uh, magnitude squared of the inner product of my state and the eigenvector. Okay? So if I'm looking at the interested in the expected outcome, I'm just the sum over all possible outcomes times the probability of getting that outcome. And I can replace this probability with this, this norm squared of the, the inner product of phi and the associated eigenvector. Okay? And if I do a little rearranging, I pull out these phi's to either side. Everything's linear here, so I can do that. I get the phi's bracketing this operator, which is in fact A. Okay, so a nice compact way of saying that the expected value of measuring A in a given state is just this product of row vector, operator, column vector. Okay? All right, good. Okay, we're particularly interested in the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to, which is the, the operator corresponding to the energy of our system. So, the and we call this Hamiltonian H. Um, it's of particular interest for one reason, first of all, it governs the time evolution of our system. Okay, and this is according to Schrodinger's equation, which we already saw yesterday. So I can imagine some starting state, it's evolving according to um, the, the, the dynamics uh, dictated by uh, the Hamiltonian, and if I solve this, um, this differential equation, we get exactly what the state will be in after I evolve for a particular time. Okay? And there's been a lot of interesting work in quantum algorithms to actually do this simulation. So um, starting with Seth Lloyd's algorithm in 1996, and to translate this into the circuit model. So to, to design a, a quantum circuit that can compute this time evolution. Okay? Um, and in this situation, we're assuming that the, this system is isolated and closed. And if it's isolated, it continues to evolve and oscillate according to the dynamics of this equation. Okay? Now, suppose that instead, um, my system interacts with an environment. Okay? Um, if it interacts with an environment, it will eventually reach an equilibrium state, which we call the Gibbs state. Okay? And the Gibbs state is also determined by this Hamiltonian H. So here's the H again. I have my, I've replaced my eigenvectors by E's to represent energy. And the state that it uh, settles in, in equilibrium, is called this Gibbs state. So we have here, I'm expressing it here as a distribution or as a, um, uh, a density matrix. Okay? So it's a distribution over... Um, eigenstates of my energy operator, and the probability is proportional to E to the minus energy of that state. Okay? So, um, and then this Z is just a normalizing constant to make sure that these probabilities add up to one. Okay? Um, Z is called my part the partition function, and this beta is a parameter that scales inversely with temperature. So the bigger beta is, the smaller the temperature. Okay? And I get a distribution, a different distribution over energy eigenstates in that case. 
Um, now, here's a, a, a slightly more compact representation of this, so of, this, of these two quantities here. Um, now, I should add here that it's generally not a proven fact that the, uh, the state of the system will converge to this Gibbs distribution. It's a conjecture, an educated guess, based on the derived from the statistical mechanics. And, um, but it works well in practice, OK? Um, there's a really nice paper uh, about sort of when the, the system converges in equilibrium and, and whether that's dependent on the, the initial state. Um, so I recommend this paper to read up on if you're interested in reading more about it. But that's generally not what we're going to be focused on here. So what we're going to be really mostly thinking about is the situation where the temperature goes to zero. Okay? The temperature goes to zero, beta's going to infinity. And the, the probability of the lowest eigenvalue, or the lowest energy state, dominates this distribution. Okay? So as beta gets big, it's the smallest energy that dominates. And we converge, assuming a unique ground state, we converge to this unique ground state. Okay? And so the primary question that we're interested in, or that I'm going to be talking about over the next three talks, is given some Hamiltonian, for some quantum system, compute the ground energy. Okay? More often, you're not actually interested in the energy itself, but you're interested in computing some property of the ground state. Okay? All right. So um, I'm going to motivate this a little bit and just talk about its connection to problems that we know about from computer science. Yes? Um, can you repeat what the temperature is? So it, it's related to energy. So you can think of as the energy of the system goes up, so does the temperature. And um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, so, so there was a question about what exactly is the temperature of the system. Um, it's, it's related to the overall energy of the system. So as energy goes up, the temperature goes up. Um, so one way to think about this is if I have, um, if I connect my uh, quantum system with a large bath, okay, and I'm, I'm forcing it into equilibrium. Um, if I look at a random state consistent with a particular energy, okay, and I trace out the, the, large, uh, the large bath system and I'm left with my original system, then I have this Gibbs state. And that temperature corresponds to the energy of the larger system. So <coughs> it's, 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 it's correlated with the overall energy. Yes? Sure. So, so um, this object co converges to the mi minimum uh, uh, the, uh, eigenvalue of H. But the question is, question is wh why a minimum eigenvalue of H is such an important issue, not the biggest? OK, so uh, I will hopefully get to that in a, in a couple of slides. The, 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 it, it, there's a lot of interesting physics that happens at the ground state, which is partly why it's in, of interest to physicists to compute this. And in some cases, the structure of the ground state tells you more about the, the actual structure of the system. So it's really more kind of where the interesting physics happens than anything else. All right, other questions? OK, so here's an example of a quantum system, a hydrogen atom. So my quantum state is the position of the electron relative to the position of the nucleus, expressed in polar coordinates. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of the details here. This is just an example. Here's the Hamiltonian that describes the energy okay, as a function of the, the electron location. And I have a term for potential energy and a per uh, term for kinetic energy, and here's the kinetic energy uh, described in terms of the polar coordinates, okay? Um, and here are the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, okay? So this is a nice example of a system that appears to be completely continuous, but sort of exhibits this quantized discrete behavior in its eigenstates, okay? Um, now, we will, in general, not be interested in these continuous systems. More often than not, and what we're going to be concerned with through most of this talk, is a situation where the underlying system is finite. Okay? And the, there's a nice 
clean classical standard basis state. So we're thinking of, say, n particles. And each of these particles have some finite dimension. And we're considering a quantum system with n of them collectively put together. Okay? The underlying uh, Hilbert space for an individual particle is c to the d. So I have d dimensions of each individual particle has some constant number of dimensions. And when I put it all together, my whole system has dimension d to the n. Okay? Now, and we've sort of seen this already with qubits, um, now we imagine the energy interactions and want to express the inter energy interactions of these particles. Now, in general, these interactions are going to be localized in some way. You don't expect particle on one side of the room to be interacting strongly with a particle on the other side. So in general, we're going to have terms that express the energy interactions of small clusters of these particles. Okay? So I've shown here a local term showing three, in this case, qubits interacting. Okay? Now, for a three-qubit system, a single Hamiltonian term on a three-qubit system is just an 8 by 8 matrix <coughs> because the dimension of the space is 2 to the 3, which is just 8. Okay? So if I were to describe this single term, I get a small 8 by 8 matrix. If I embed this term within a larger quantum system, I actually have n particles here. So my Hamiltonian has to be 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And these combine by the tensor product. So I'm taking the tensor product of my Hamiltonian for this three qubit system and tensoring it with the identity on the rest of the particles. Okay. So what does that look like? Now I cheated a little bit and I, um, I'm having my Hamiltonian interact on the last three particles instead of the first three just because the matrix looks nicer this way. Um, so what does it look like in this case? Well then I get this nice block diagonal structure. Okay. And each of these blocks is a copy of this 8 by 8 matrix. So if I'm considering what this local Hamiltonian term looks like when I'm expressing it as a large operator on the entire system, it has a lot of structure and this is what it looks like. Okay, so this is just the tensor product. So yes? Are there no diagonal entries zero? Uh, yes, this is all zero. This is a big z all zeros here, all zeros here, and the only non-zero entries are along these this block. Yes. Okay, so now we have a sum of these terms. We have these three particles interacting and these three particles interacting, clusters of three interacting in this system. Okay, and so the entire Hamiltonian is a sum of these interacting terms. All right. So I have a system of n d-dimensional particles. Here I have their two dimensions. I've kind of written them as spins. Um, but general, generalizing, you can think of them as d-dimensions. The larger Hilbert space has dimension d to the n. The Hamiltonian is a d to the n by d to the n matrix, so it's huge. Um, but I still have a compact representation of this Hamiltonian. Okay. So if I'm saying that uh, each term uh, can only operate on k different particles, then I can have at most n choose k different terms. Okay? And, and if k is a constant, then this is going to be a polynomial number of terms. And each of these terms is specified by a d to the k by d to the k matrix. So I have d to the 2k different entries. So if d is a constant and k is a constant, I have a constant number of entries in each one of these terms. Okay, so this is a very succinct representation of this system. And the name of the game is to find the ground energy of this large matrix. Now, we know you can compute the ground energy or the lowest eigenvalue of a matrix efficiently. The problem is that this matrix is too large to work with. Okay, so we want to know what is the ground state of the system. Yes? So, uh, actually, two related questions, I think. Um... Uh-huh. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, why is it justified to sort of just think about like a finite number of particles interacting at each uh, um, by itself? Uh, I mean, is this physically justified or are you designing a system to have this property? Um, 
Yeah. Should I answer the first one? Okay, so yes, yeah, so, so we are thinking of this as spatial locality. Okay, so we're not necessarily imposing this right now, but uh, particles that are physically far apart from each other presumably are not going to have a strong energy interaction with each other. So these local terms are supposedly uh, characterizing the energy interaction of particles that are physically close to each other. And so, so, so this is approx an approximation and it holds for like systems that people care about? Yeah, so it is, and all of these I will, I was going to say this later, but all of these sort of Hamiltonians that we come up with, these models, are simplifications of real systems, okay? So the real Hamiltonian on a quantum system is far too complex to actually characterize and represent and simulate. So typically what physicists do is they come up with simplified models that characterize some properties of interest. So here I've, I've shown the, the spin of an electron, but there are many different properties of the electron that I'm, or degrees of freedom in the system that I'm not capturing. So all of these things are sort of an estimate of what's actually happening. But in general, we expect that, that the interaction of far apart particles to be insignificant in terms of. Um, all right, uh, and the second thing is, um, why is the, is it clear why putting together all of these like triples uh, sort of should manifest itself mathematically by adding these Hamiltonian terms? Like why is, you know, if I have a, these three particles acting like this and these three particles acting, acting like this, then sort of you need to add the two Hamiltonians to capture the entire system rather than doing some other way Operation? to combine the matrices. Well, I, uh, yeah, so I'm getting energy from these two interacting and I'm getting energy from, th well, these three interacting and these three interacting. So each, each combination is contributing some energy and it's the energy of the whole system is going to be the sum of these individual energies that I have. So. So sum of energies translates to sum of Hamiltonians? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. And because everything's linear here. So if I'm looking at the expected, you know, energy of the system, if I add a bunch of terms together, I'm going to get a sum of energies. All right, other questions? All right. Okay, so the input to our problem is some Hamiltonian expressed in this way, this nice compact representation, two real numbers. And I want to know, uh, is my ground energy less than E or greater than E plus delta? And so I'm giving myself, it's not realistic to expect to compute this energy down to a very uh, small precision. So I'm giving myself a little gap here as a promise problem. So that's not necessarily physically realistic, but you know, in terms of estimating the energy, I'm assuming that I've got some sort of bound between the two to make it into a nice decision problem to reason about. So this sort of basically is characterizing the, com the complexity of computing the energy relative to some small error, okay? Okay, so I can look at very variations of the problem. So this is actually getting back to your question of locality. Um, the, the term locality is a little unfortunate. It's become part of the, the literature. It does imply spatial proximity. But when we consider sort of abstract models, uh, when we say locality, we're just saying that each term operates on k different particles. Potentially, they could be far apart. So we could mathematically create these Hamiltonians that, that operate on particles that can't be close to each other, OK? Um, but in terms of the term locality, when I say something's k local, I'm just limiting the number of particles it can act on. Uh, another variation is I can consider different particle dimensions. I can consider qubits or qtrits or uh, larger dimensional particles. And finally, um, a particular interest is if there is some underlying geometry to the system. So um, we often consider um, different sort of grids in different dimensional spaces with a particle located at each location. And we approximate the energy by these neighboring terms. So each term is now too local here. It, each edge uh, represents a term that I'm adding to my Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is another variant of the problem that's of particular interest, and this is um, probably the, the, the model that's most studied within the physics community because it represents sort of a natural physical model. 
Okay, so we'll look at different variations of this problem along the way. Okay, so uh, just so you don't think I'm completely making this up, um, I have an example. Um, the reason I chose this particular example out of the literally thousands of examples in the condensed matter literature that's computing the ground state um, is that uh, Steve White is a colleague of mine at UC Irvine, and I could go over to his office and spend a little time with him, and he explained his paper to me. So that's, what, that's why I chose this one. Um, it's also appeared in science, so it's of some scientific significance as well. So what are they doing here? So they have this beautiful lattice structure called the Kagame lattice. And the vertex of every, uh, each vertex has um, a spin located on it, up or down. So it's a qubit, okay? And the physics governing the interaction of two neighboring particles along an edge is governed by this little four by four matrix, okay? And this is called the Heisenberg antiferromagnet model, okay? And it's well studied in the literature um, why antiferromagnet? Well, you can see there's a positive energy contribution for spins that are lined, both up or both down. There's a negative if they're anti-aligned, which is energetically favorable. Um, I have these off-diagonal terms that denote sort of movement between the two. So in general, the ground state is going to be a quantum superposition to represent that. Um, and notice that my, this lattice has um, odd cycles, okay? So what that means is, in general, it's gonna be a frustrated system. I can't have an odd cycle with alternating spins around it, okay? And frustrated means that I can't find an overall state for this uh, larger system that simultaneously reaches the ground state of each individual term, okay? So there's gonna be some frustration in this system, okay? Um, so what were they interested in doing? They were computing this, this ground state, trying to get an understanding of what the structure of the ground state was. So one possibility is that it's a valence bond crystal, which means that there are sort of periodic pattern of clusters, and the uh, particles within each cluster are entangled, and there's not entanglement between the clusters. So we have these kind of, these different sets of particles that cover this lattice, and um, this, the entanglement is sort of contained within each of these different clusters. So that's one possibility for what the ground state looks like. Another possibility that it's what's called a spin liquid, which is a somewhat mysterious, not completely well understood state of matter. But the idea is that any local measurement is gonna appear completely disordered, like a liquid. Meaning that we won't have these, you won't see broken symmetries like you would in the other case, okay? Um, now, it's conjectured that these uh, spin liquids actually have a fair amount of quantum structure underneath. So they could be a superposition of different uh, valence bond states, which sort of, uh, sort of uh, dissipate the, the, the symmetries. So the symmetries vanish when you look at a quantum superposition of these. So um, quantum spin liquids are sort of... A, a, uh, a state that, that's not well understood, that people are trying to, to understand uh, what systems give rise to them. One of the reasons that they may be of interest is that it's conjectured that the, the low level energy states, that just above the ground state, the collective behavior of the particles at these low level states are best described mathematically as quasi-particles. And these quasi-particles have very interesting exotic physics that's not seen elsewhere. So this, it's, it's of particular interest for that reason. There are various conjectures of what this might be used for, um, maybe even a model for quantum computing using these particles to interact with each other. So there's a, there's a lot that's not understood. It's a basic uh, state of, you know, scientific state that we'd like to understand better, okay? Um, and I think the conclusion in this particular paper was that, in fact, the ground state is the spin liquid, okay? And so, uh, this particular paper uses. When you say conclusion, is it sky? Yeah, when you say conclusion, it's numerical conclusion. Numerical. I was just about to get <laughs> say that. So this is all done numerically. Um, so uh, in particular, Steve has is the inventor of an algorithm called DMRG, which is probably the most successful heuristic to find the ground states in one D systems, and they've adapted this method to actually work 
in 2D systems by snaking the 1D around this, this lattice. So these are sort of heuristic numerical systems. They, find, they try and find the ground state and they sort of measure properties of it. So this is all numerics and heuristics. All right? Yes? Um, so the way they did this particular one, so they want to actually, oh, so how, how large was this system? Um, I think in the hundreds. Um, and they want to sort of get a sense of what it looks like on the infinite plane. So what they did is they looked at cylinders. And so with the cylinders don't have these kind of weird edge properties that might change the state of the system. And they looked at longer and longer cylinders. And, and by comparing the energy per particle of one length to another, they kind of assume that it converges because the ground, the, 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 um, the border states weren't having as, you know, as large an effect. So it sort of converged at some point. Is this the approximation? Yeah, it's all Is heuristic. It, yeah. It's an approximation to Yeah, it, yeah. It's just a, an approximation. So it's numeric, so the, it's, there's numerical error involved, there's calculation errors involved. All right. Okay, so this is just for motivation to sort of convince you that it's, it's not a completely made up problem. Okay, so one of the things is, is that in 2D there seems to be a lot of magic happening. There's a lot of more interesting <coughs> physics that arises in these 2D systems. And it also appears to be very difficult computationally, both in theory and in practice. So um, even in terms of developing heuristics, it's very challenging to find methods that find the ground states in some of these systems. And so we're interested from this point of view is looking at what's the complexity of this local Hamiltonian problem, okay? So I have a set of local constraints and I want to find a global state that minimizes cost. So as a computer scientist, this sound should sound a little bit familiar. We do this a lot. Um, and in fact, the, the local Hamiltonian problem has a very nice correspondence to questions that we study in computer science all the time. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. Um, let's say uh, the standard basis, if I have an NQDIT system where each particle has dimension D, the standard basis can be denoted by classical strings, each of length N, and each of the characters comes from a set um, of size D. Okay, so it's just a classical string. Um, in the special case where my Hamiltonian happens to be diagonal in this basis, okay, in the standard basis, um, then the overall, um, the overall uh, underlying optimal state is also going to be a standard basis state, okay? And I can think of this as each, each one of these terms operates on some subset of the particles, and the value along the diagonal associated with a particular k-tuple tells me the cost or energy of setting each of the variables to those particular values. Okay, so it's a little function from, um, from k of the variables to possible values. So it's, a, it's um, yeah, so it's a function from length k, uh, vectors to real numbers that tell me the cost of a particular setting of the variables, okay? Um, what do you mean by cost? Um, so it's just an abstract notion of cost. So in this case, what we're trying to do is minimize energy. So in our, in our case for the Hamiltonian, we want to find the state that has the lowest minimum energy. I can imagine using this problem to model all kinds of other things like uh, uh, scheduling problems or, or uh, traveling salesman problems, in which case these costs would represent something else. So it's just sort of an abstract uh, minimization optimization problem, which can be used to model a variety of different phenomena, from physics to operations research to, to other areas. So where do, where do these matrices come from? Is, oh, sorry. So the question was, where do these, these particular costs come from? Okay, so that's modeling the, the whatever problem is at hand with uh, some type of 
uh, constraint satisfaction. So in, in physics, they're modeling the interaction of particles and conjecturing what the interaction energy would be by setting different particles to different values. Okay? If I were, say, um, modeling um, some other constraint, some other scheduling problem, it would be the constraint, you know, this might be the cost of having scheduling job one at time t and job two at some other time. So it comes from, it's derived from the actual problem that you're trying to model. Okay, other questions? So the ground state, if my Hamiltonian just happens to have this very special form, the ground state itself is a standard basis state, which is just a classical string. So there's really nothing quantum here anymore. I just have classical strings. And this is actually the weighted constraint satisfaction problem, which is an abstract optimization problem that can used, be used to model all matter, uh, many different problems in different contexts. All right. Of even more, you know, uh, a even more specialized case is uh, Boolean satisfiability, in particular 3SAT. So here I have, I have n Boolean variables, a set of m clauses, and each clause is a disjunction of three literals. So literal is either a variable or a negation of a literal. So this is a classic problem in computer science. Um, and the question that we want to answer is, is there an assignment to the Boolean variables that simultaneously satisfies all the clauses. In other words, if I set the variables according to those values, each one of these clauses evaluates to one. Okay, so this is a classic problem. And um, local Hamiltonian is even a more special case of, uh, uh, sat is even a more special case of local Hamiltonian where my matrices have this particular form. Off diagonals are all, all zero, okay? And the diagonal is all zeros except for one location. So in this case, I have x, not y, and z. There's only one setting that causes this to evaluate to false. So I put a 1 there as a sort of a cost to represent the cost of that. And so that can be also represented in Kent notation. And uh, this Hamiltonian has a zero energy ground state if and only if the set of clauses is satisfiable. Okay, so this corresponds nicely to a problem that we sort of know and love from computer science. Another if question? If you had more clauses, would there be more ones on the diagonal? So the question is, if I had more clauses, would be, there be more ones along the diagonal? Not in an individual term, but remember when I'm, <coughs> each of these is an eight by eight matrix, I'm tensoring it with all the other, the identity on everything else, and then adding it into my big Hamiltonian. So for each one of these terms, I have a lot of, I'm contributing a lot of ones to the diagonal of the overall Hamiltonian. Okay? Another question? Is that reduction polynomial? Is that reduction polynomial? So yeah, so if I take an instance of 3SAT, um, I can just express my Hamiltonian each each clause corresponds to one little 8 by 8 matrix. And now I want to minimize the energy of my system. And if I have a zero energy eigenstate, that corresponds to an assignment, a Boolean assignment that satisfies the clauses. She's never writing down the big Hamiltonian. Yeah, so I never actually, yeah. So I never actually create the, the large one. I, I'm always referring to this sort of succinct representation, which I'm only giving you the local terms. And it's implicit that I'm tensoring it with the identity and adding everything in. And the question is, uh, so I'll repeat the question. And the question is, can I still compute the ground state energy? Yeah, so I don't need to create the large matrix in order to ask the question, is there a ground energy? So I have the succinct representation of this larger Hamiltonian and a ground state to that larger Hamiltonian exists of energy zero if and only if the set of clauses is satisfiable. Okay, and I don't ever have to actually create this matrix to actually answer, to do this reduction. Another question? Can we? So in the spin, spin liquid problem that we were seeing earlier, 
So uh-huh. you said there might not be a ground state energy solution to each local Hamiltonian. Right. So in that case, like, does that imply there is no ground state energy for the entire system? No. Okay. So what? So so what that means is that the ground state is what we call frustrated. So every Hamiltonian has the lowest eigenvalue. It's a matrix. It has a set of eigenvalues. There's going to be a lowest one. The state that corresponds to the lowest one will not have, if I look at each individual term on that state, it won't achieve the smallest eigenvalue for each individual term simultaneously. That's all it's saying. Okay, so here, and, that, and that's a good question in this context actually, so I'm asking here, is there an unfrustrated ground state here? So that's what corresponds to a zero energy ground state, is a, a state that simultaneously satisfies all the clauses. It just so happens that the question, if there's a zero energy ground state, it happens to be <coughs> unfrustrated. But we know in the spin liquid case that there's not going to be a, a uh, the ground state will be frustrated. Even in the classical setting, you think of max F and then. So yeah, I can, maybe I'll just say that your point is even in the classical setting, you can consider a set of clauses that can't simultaneously be satisfied, but you want to say max sat. Find the assignment that satisfies as many clauses as possible. Yes. So I guess the, a classical version of local Hamiltonian would be really max sat. Uh, maybe can I take one second to just explain something? With the microphone, you can. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm taking just sorry. I'm taking just one second to explain why we're insisting so much on. Uh, Sandy <coughs> repeating the question or somebody using the mic. There are about 30 people on the side and they have no way of hearing us without the mic. Okay, so please do remember to do that so that everybody, including those 30 people, can know what we're talking about. Thanks. All right, and maybe I'll take another mic here. So that this uh, you, okay. I thought that was going to be a scientific clarification, but it's actually a, <laughs> a technical clarification. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, when you said uh, frustrated, so if you do not achieve your minimal uh, state, or it, yeah, then, then you refer to it achieved or not achieved, or maybe if you are close to that, you also refer to that as some situation that you consider. When you said the frustrated is that you did not to your minimal uh, energy. Uh, no, frustrated, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, so the frustrated <laughs> just means that if I look at each individual clause, mm-hmm. yeah, I, the, the overall I state that minimizes, yeah, so if I look at the state that overall, mini- there's always a minimum. Yeah, uh, but, but the local, but maybe the global minimal, uh, w- the global minimal, when you look at it, Locally is not the local minimal. Right. And what I am asking is if you are, so here we are asking if it's zero or one in the three sets, so it doesn't matter, but if it's, you are close to achieving, so this is an eigenvalue and you are close to your minimal, do you refer to this in some situation? Does it interesting or is, or you just count <coughs> if you achieve the mi- your local minimal? The minimum or not? Yeah. Well, when we phrase this, because we're computer scientists, we sort of translate this, this into a decision problem, then we're just asking to be lower than a specific but value. Is, but physicists, they're interested in the, in the actual ground state, in, in sort of understanding what the, if you're interested in the understanding the structure of the actual ground state, you want to get close to the minimum energy. Being lower than a certain threshold isn't necessarily going to tell you what the structure of the ground state is. So really in the physics application, you're not just interested in the value of the energy. You want to sort of create this ground state and sort of ask what some of the properties of this ground state are. All right. All right. OK, so I declared something was NP complete, and I didn't even define NP. But we're going to actually, the point of the, the definition here is to lead up to the version of the quantum version of NP. So. Um, so a problem lies in NP. Okay, this is a class of problems. If there's some polynomial time algorithm A and takes two inputs, if the X part of the input is in the language, 
then there is some witness y that I can plug in that causes my algorithm to accept. If x isn't in the language, then no matter what y I give you, um, the algorithm y will reject. And the, the, this, we call this y the witness, because it's a witness to the fact that x is in the language. And it has to be bounded. Uh, this should be the length of x. The, the length of y is bounded by a polynomial in the length of x. OK, so just you know, think y is sat, for example, the problem that we just defined. Why is that in NP? Well, we can think of our input x as encoding an instance of 3sat. It's a description of the clauses and variables and, and such. And a witness is just an assignment to the variables. OK, so it's a witness to the fact that the, the instance of 3sat is satisfiable. So if I give you a satisfying assignment to a set of clauses, there's certainly an easy way to check. The nice, efficient algorithm that can just check that all the clauses are satisfied, that's my algorithm A. If the instance isn't satisfiable, no matter what assignment to the variables I give you, you're not going to accept that. So you'll reject. OK, so this just gives a little intuition. So this is the class of problems where a solution, a yes solution, is easy to check given the appropriate information. It may be hard to find that information without it being handed to you. Okay. Now, what we're going to be looking for is a quantum version of this. But notice that this is defined in terms of deterministic algorithms that either reject or accept. So we need, first of all, before we get to quantum, we need a probabilistic version of this. Okay? And, oh, and let me just say about, I forgot my next point. Uh, what does it mean to have a polynomial time algorithm A? For the time being, we'll use the circuit model that Dorit defined yesterday. Um, where we have a polynomial size circuit family um, and this circuit accepts uh, if an, uh, this circuit outputs one if and only if the algorithm accepts. Okay, so that's, and she already had the um, uniformity talk with you. So um, you know that these, these circuits can't uh, uh, encode kind of arbitrarily difficult functions. So for the input n, um, you have to be able to construct the circuit. Okay. All right. On to the probabilistic version. Uh, class Merlin Arthur. So we have Merlin talking to Arthur, who's trying to convince him of a particular fact. And now my algorithm, my verification algorithm, is a randomized algorithm. It takes in two inputs. And if x is in the language, there's a witness y that causes the um, randomized algorithm to accept with probably two thirds. If x isn't in the language, then no matter what witness I give you, uh, the probability of acceptance is less than one third. Okay? And again, we can think of this in the circuit family model. Now, x and y, as well as the random string, are inputs to the circuit. <coughs> Once you fix x, y, and r, it's just a completely deterministic circuit. Um, and when I'm taking the probability of acceptance, I'm taking the probability over uniform choices for this random string r. Okay? So x is in the language. There's a y that causes the circuit to output 1 with probably at least 2 thirds. And x not in the language, no matter what string, the probability I output 1 is, oh, that should be less than 1 third. OK? All right. I think we're ready for quantum now. Quantum Merlin Arthur. OK? So now the verifier and the witness are quantum. Yes? Question, and, and we're going to. Um, how is that related to BPP? Um, I, I have a slide on that later, but it's basically a BPP is this model without the witness. OK, so you just get the input, and you have to compute and accept or reject. Yeah. So P to NP is BPP to Merlin Arthur. OK. OK, so now we're quantum. The verifier is a quantum circuit, and the witness is a quantum circuit. So if x is in the language, there's a quantum witness that causes my quantum circuit to accept with probably at least 2 thirds. If x isn't in the language, then no matter what quantum witness I give you, the probability you accept is at most one third. So same definition, just inserting a quantum witness and a quantum verifier. Okay? And again, the, the quantum algorithm is, is we're using the circuit model. Okay? So 
And I could imagine having some ancilla zero qubits here, but I just didn't bother. Okay, so let's talk about amplification for a second. Um, we had these two-thirds and one-third. They're somewhat arbitrary. Can we amplify them to be arbitrarily close? So I can define the class Merlin Arthur CP. Um, uh, so C is completeness. So uh, if X is in the language, then the probability I accept is at least C. Uh, if uh, X is not in the language, the probability I accept is at most S. And really all we need is for C and S the difference to be them to, to be at least one over poly, okay? And through repetition, I can drive these probabilities arbitrarily close to zero and to one. Sandy, okay? did you mean the P to be S up there? M A C S. Yeah, yeah, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, correction. All right. So, um, so if I if I um, look at my soundness and completeness. Uh, values, those are, I have a gap of 1 over poly in between them. So I can repeat this m times, and my threshold is the average of the two. Okay? And um, so if this is an accepting, if x is an accepting, um, if x is in the language, and I'm given a good witness for it, my probability of acceptance should be somewhere north of c. Okay? And if it happens that I repeat it m times, but the, um, the threshold is below this value, that's a very low probability event. And we can just use Chernoff's inequality to establish that. For sufficiently large number of repetitions, the likelihood that the number of uh, acceptance is below the threshold, given that the likelihood of each trial is above C, is going to be exponentially small. Okay? And we'll use this over and over again several times. So. Okay, we can do the same thing now with QMA. Um, I can, and I still have the P up there from the, <laughs> I cut it, copy and pasted. So, um, so I can now uh, give you arbitrary values for acceptance and rejection. And again, as long as this gap is larger than 1 over poly, I can drive the, the uh, probabilities to 0 and 1 arbitrarily close or exponentially close. Um, for completeness, so to show that if, uh, that, um, that there exists a witness that can achieve these probabilities, I just need to give you m independent copies of my original witness. Okay? And each one of these is a trial that succeeds with probability at least c. Okay? So if I repeat it m times and the probability that I get something below the threshold is exponentially small. So because I'm giving you these M independent copies, it's an, it's an independent uh, Bernoulli trial every time. Okay, and we can apply turn-off bounds. Um, the situation is a little trickier with soundness. Okay, so we're going to be, Merlin gives you one quantum witness all at once. Okay, so there's no way to guarantee uh, that these are actually independent, unentangled copies. Okay, so he's just giving you some witness that m is my number of iterations and y is the number of original uh, qubits in the original witness. I'm getting m times y qubits, which could be some messy entangled state. Okay, um, it turns out there's not too much of a problem here. So um, remember, my assumption is that no matter what witness I give you, the probability of acceptance is at most s. Okay, so let's consider the first, and I can execute these independent uh, executions of my verifier in any order I want because they're operating on different subsets of the qubits. So they, they commute with each other. Okay, so let's say I do v1 first. Okay, in general, this state is now going to be um, a mixed state because it's entangled with the rest. A mixed state is just a distribution over pure states, and if for every state the probability of acceptance is at most s, certainly a probability distribution over those will have acceptance of at least s. I may measure here, and that may change the value uh, or change the value of these qubits here, but that's okay. When I do the, run this second verifier, Again, it's some mixed state, which may depend on the measurement that happened before, but it doesn't really matter. I still have a new mixed state, 
And again, the probability of acceptance is at most S, and it continues like that. So the, even if we condition on the outcome of V1's measurements, the probability of acceptance is at most S, and I can continue. So now to analyze this, I need something a little bit fancier than a turnoff bound. I need some type of martingale, but still you can get sort of the exponential decrease in probability. Question? Okay. So how do you produce M independent copies of the same like, quantum state? Um, I'm assuming that um, Merlin can handle that. <laughs> That's Merlin's problem, not my problem. So, um, so I'm assuming that if he, could, if he could manufacture one copy, then he could manufacture M copies. <laughs> Um, is it meaningful uh, for the witness to be classical? And if so, why, why the definition, in the definition it is a quantum state? That's a great question. And that's a different com complexity class called QCMA, in which the witness is classical and the verifier is quantum. And we don't really understand the relationship between these two classes. Well, obviously, QCMA is contained in QMA, but we don't know whether that's a proper containment or not. All right, moving on. Okay, um, I just want to mention here, so this repetition required a lot more qubits in the witness, okay? Um, and it, to, add, to actually answer your question, more specifically, I, here I only want the existence of a witness that causes. So if there existed one, I can, there exists M independent copies, and, and which should drive the probability down. So we're just asking for the existence of a witness, and I can just copy it M times. But this, um, this method requires a lot more qubits, a factor of M more qubits. And you could ask, is that really necessary? Okay. Um, so there's a really nice, um, result, which I'm only going to summarize here, that says that actually you can reuse the qubits. Um, so if I, if I'm, so now what I'm doing is not just naming the um, the probabilities of error, but I'm I'm naming the the um, the function governing the number of qubits in my witness. It's some polynomial, okay? And the result, due to Marius and Marriott and Watrous, is that I can drive down this probability. I are exponentially close to zero and one, and keep the witnesses the same size, okay? Um, this is a little non-intuitive because remember these, um, this verification procedure requires measurement. And so once I measure my state, presumably I've changed it. Um, I'm just gonna say a little bit about it. So basically the trick is to sort of probabilistically back up after a measurement and then measure whether you <coughs> successfully prob successfully backed up, okay? If you did, great, you're back in the original state. If you didn't, you still know kind of what part of the space you're in and you can repeat the experiment. And then you use the principle of deferred measurements. This is sort of a rough overview. Um, the reason it's, I hear it referred to as the marriott watrous trick is that it appears uh, in many different places and it's actually kind of a useful gadget to use in terms of backing up from the measurement. So, yes. Mike. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can just repeat because it's okay. a very small, short question. Okay. I was just wondering, is this immediate or uh, very easy if uh, you started with this one? Because then may maybe measurement does not change at all? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think What's so. the question? So the question is, is if you have probability one of completeness, then when you measure, you actually don't change the state. So then there's nothing, you haven't changed the state when you measure and you don't need to back up. And yeah, I no, this right. is not the reason because you, this, is, this would be the reason in case of, of completeness one, but it's not, it, it doesn't need to. Completeness one is easier. Oh, oh yeah, uh, if we yeah, have completeness yeah, one, then we don't need this trick. And that yeah. I think is correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. But this trick is also called rewinding and it has to do with, I mean, it might interest the cryptographer in the room, yeah. <laughs> naturally. So uh, uh, I, I, 
so can I explain by what I mean by back up? I, I kept it at the 30. <laughs> so, um, so we do some unitary on this, which is the verification procedure. And then I measure, OK? And then basically, quantum computation is reversible. So I undo what the verifier did. And I measure whether I started in the same state. Like I measure my ancilla qubits and whether they're actually 0 after backing up. So I, I do the computation forward. I take my measurement. I try and reverse the computation. So I apply the reverse of the, the, the process I used to get there. And then I measure, did I, did I end up where I started from? And if I did, then I successfully reversed it. And if not, I'm in some other space, and I have to adjust accordingly. Uh, sorry, let, just, let me just make a comment. So there was something that uh, actually I think was not covered in the basic lectures yesterday morning, which is that if you have a circuit that computes a certain unitary, then uh, you can also efficiently come up with a circuit that computes the sort of reverse of this, uh, of this unitary. It was not explicitly said, but yeah. you know, everybody. Thank you, yes. Yeah. So let me just make it sort yeah. of explicit. So in a quantum computation, you can always reverse anything you do in the forward direction. So I, it is a little mysterious, and I'm, I didn't. Sorry, yeah. So the question is, when I back up, I only measure the ancillary qubits. That's right. OK. I just wanted to, this is more like a commercial for this technique than anything else. Um, OK, so here's our, uh, we have NP contained in MA, contained in QMA. Where does this live? Well, these are contained in larger spaces. PP is the class of probabilistic computation, where we're bounded away from 1 half, but not necessarily. It's larger than 1 half or smaller than 1 half, but it can be arbitrarily close to 1 half. Okay? And this is all contained in P space, which is polynomial space, okay? just to kind of give it a home. Um, how does it relate to the, oh, and the two results that we'll be very interested in talking about is, first of all, uh, this, the classic results that Boolean satisfiability is complete for the class NP. And we will be looking at the analogous quantum version of this is that local QMA is com local Hamiltonian is complete for QMA. OK? So that's our project. Okay. Um, how do these relate to the classes that Dorit introduced yesterday? We have this containment. So uh, each of these is the version of the class above without the witness. So you're just given the input and you compute. Okay, so let's, let me just define the Hamil local Hamiltonian a little bit more precisely. Okay, so I'm given as input a set of uh, R Hermitian positive semi-definite matrices um, operating on K qubits of dimension D and bounded norm. I'm going to justify those in a second, these, these little conditions that I kind of slipped in there. Um, uh, each matrix indicates a set of qubits that it's operating on. So out of the n qubits in the system. And each matrix is given with polynomial bits. So each entry is at most using uh, most polynomial n bits. And I'm given also two real numbers. The delta is at least 1 over poly n. And the question I want to answer is the smi smallest eigenvalue of this larger Hamiltonian less than e or greater than E plus delta. No, I don't what happens if it's E plus delta over 2? If I'm in the, it, yeah. what happens if I'm in this range? Then I don't have to answer correctly. <laughs> so I'm off the hook. And this is just to give us a gap to, sh to say because I can't, I can't um, uh, <coughs> calculate the energy pr too precisely. Question? Uh, yeah, so are the matrices given in some succinct uh, form? Or um, fully explicitly? Just, you know, k, k to the d by k to the d entries with a bunch of polynomial bits in each entry. Mm -hmm. All right. So like I would give you the Heisenberg one that we saw before is, oh. you know, a 4 by 4 matrix oh, okay. with yeah, a little, okay. yeah, little k. Okay. Yeah. I don't need to give you the full one. I can give you the little one. And the, and the identity, the tensor with the identity is implicit. The big H is to the n, and, and we kind of abuse notation like this. So I, this, exactly. So implicit in each of these terms is tensoring with all of the 
the qubits that I'm not operating on the identity. It just gets notationally <coughs> messy. Question, wait. I can repeat it? Okay. So how large K has to be for it to be uh, like QMA complete? Because so when you reduce it for 3 set, you needed K to be 3, right? Yeah, so we'll get to that. easier for smaller K? Yeah, well, we'll get to that. That's, the, uh, your, that's my punchline. So, um, <laughs> um, actually, you can get down to 2. Yes, yeah, unlike SAT, unlike the classical world. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, so let me just justify these two um, conditions that I kind of slipped in here, is that I can sort of adjust each Hamiltonian term and make it so. So I want a bounded norm at most 1, positive semi-definite, meaning that all the eigenvalues are greater than or equal to 0. I can add an identity, and that just shifts all the eigenvalues or I can multiply by a constant and that scales the factors. So I can, I can adjust my Hamiltonian to, to achieve those conditions, okay? All right. Okay, so uh, let's talk about containment first, okay? So why do, are each of these problems contained in their corresponding completeness classes? When we talked about the fact that Boolean satisfiability is contained in NP, we had to say that there's a witness that you could use to verify that the instance is satisfiable. That instance is just the assignment. Okay, simple enough. Um, why is local Hamiltonian con contained in QMA? Um, we're asking, is there a state whose energy according to H is less than or equal to E? Um, in other words, its average energy is less than E, and the natural witness is just the state itself. Okay? Um, so what we're guaranteed, though, is that this expected energy is either less than E or greater than E plus delta. So we have this gap. Um, and so what we need is some type of measurement that whose outcome is proportional to this expectation. Okay, if we can do that measurement, then the outcome is either going to be greater than E, uh, less than E, or greater than E plus delta. Okay, and this R is scaling it to make sure that it's a sensible probability that it's between 0 and 1. And then I can repeat this measurement. Okay? Okay, so let's just talk about what that measurement would look like. Um, so what I'm going to do is pick a term at random. Okay, here's the term. I've expressed it in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. There are k, um, d to the k of them. Okay, and remember we're assuming that it's scaled appropriately, so each one of these eigenvalues is between 0 and 1, okay? Um, so now I'm going to add an auxiliary bit, okay? And I'm going to compute uh, this function, okay? So it's going to take the eigenvector Vaj, and it's going to rotate this qubit according to the eigenvalue. There's a lot of details that I'm totally sweeping under the rug here, okay? Um, so I'm giving you these matrices as uh, d to the k by d to the k entries, and somehow there's a quantum circuit that has to translate those into computing this unitary. There's a way to do that. <laughs> so I just, I'm going to just assume that I can do it. You can imagine classically, you'd take your Hamiltonian, you'd compute the eigenvalues, and then you want to actually build a circuit that sort of tests whether uh, you're in each one of these eigenvalues and then rotates the qubits accordingly. So um, it's not too hard to, to imagine that you can do this. You just, there's just a lot of details in doing it, all right? Okay, but what does this give me is if I have some state, okay, and uh, my ancillary qubit is zero, I can express my state in the eigen basis of this Hamiltonian term, okay? This is, these are the, these are the um, k qubits that my operator is operating on, and this is the rest of the qubits, okay? So I can express it in this basis. Um, when I do this operation, um, each, for each one of these states, the qubit gets rotated by the appropriate amount, okay? And this is all happening in quantum superposition, okay? So now when I measure whether I'm in the one state or not, okay, 
what's the probability if I have this state and I measure this last qubit, what's the probability that I get one? Well, it's going to be the sum of the magnitude squared of all of the states that correspond to one. Okay, so I have a product of alpha and square root of lambda here, and I'm looking at the sum of the magnitude squares of those values. So the probability of measuring one is the sum uh, over all j, the magnitude squared of, of alpha times the eigenvalue lambda. Okay? Um, and sure enough, that's the expected energy. Okay? All right, so that's one term. What we're actually doing, if we look at, we picked this random h at the beginning, so the outcome really, if I picked ha, the probability of measuring one is this expectation in the energy. I'm really uh, averaging over all possible choices for my ha. So in the end, my expected uh, uh, value of my measurement is one over r of the energy. So this is what I needed to get to measure this energy. So this value is at most e over r, or at least e plus delta over r. My gap has shrunk by a factor of r, but the r is polynomial, so that's OK. All right? Yes, question. How about now? Good. OK. Um, couldn't you just um, measure these qubits in the basis that is specified by VAJs? Would that, would that not give you, like, and then take the result and uh, flip a coin with some probability that depends on lambda AJ or something, uh, rather than adding the, the, this additional qubit? Just trying to understand if there's something sort of inherent here that requires you to add this additional qubit and do these things. So you're saying measure the energy yeah, yeah just me measure the bits of uh, the qubits of A in the basis V sub AJ, right? This is an ortho, this is, this is uh, sort of an orthonormal basis, right? So you're going to get one of these vectors, VAJ, and then output lambda AJ or, you know, something that depends on lambda AJ. Well, this measurement, this, this, this ancillary qubit is a way of doing this measurement. So you're putting the result of the measurement in a qubit which you're, which you're then measuring. So it's... Just like tossing a coin, I guess. Basically, what you're doing, you're measuring the local energy and then tossing, tossing coin. With probability that's proportional to the lambda, right? So that's yeah. the same thing? So, okay. yeah. What, should I repeat that? So I, I think it doesn't matter. It's okay. just, if it's the same thing, then. Yeah. What's that? The state phi is the state of all of the qubits. Yes, yeah, so the state right. of all the qubits, yes. The global state. So this is your witness that I'm giving you for the, for the overall energy, right? Okay, so this gives us containment. Um, and now we have the, the job of, usually it's the hardness <coughs> result that's, that's, that's difficult. So let me just kind of walk through some of the aspects of Cook Levin, which is the original proof that Boolean satisfiability is NP-hard. And we're going to retain some of those ideas when we do the QMA completeness result. So um, the hardness result, what does it look like? We start with an X, and we want to know, is it in my language? Okay, what does it mean to be in the language? It means that there's a witness Y that causes this circuit to accept. Okay, and we want to translate that into an instance of SAT. Okay, so we want to translate that into a Boolean formula so that the Boolean formula is satisfiable if and only if there exists a Y that causes the circuit to output one. Okay. Um, So uh, we're going to do the same thing in the QMA reduction. Um, we want to know, is X in my language? I know there's a quantum circuit that uh, if it's in the language, then there's some quantum witness that I can input to the circuit that causes me to measure one with high probability and not <coughs> otherwise. Okay? And we're going to translate that into a, we're going to start with five local okay, and then go from there. Um, we're going to start with an instance of five local Hamiltonian and show that um, this Hamiltonian has a ground energy below some value or larger than some value depending on whether X is in the language or not. So the structure of the proof is exactly the same. Um, but of course, this Hamiltonian has to encode X in it. So this is very, it's specific to X. Okay. Um, so 
going back to the NP hardness, um, so the reduction, um, we basically are computing this, this Boolean circuit to a Boolean formula and adding a term that says, okay, did I accept or not, okay? Um, I made this nice slide with all these gates on it showing how to, to transfer the circuit to the formula. And then I realized that actually the circuit to the formula is the trivial part of the whole thing. And the real hard part is going from the Turing machine to the circuit. So um, translating a circuit to a Boolean formula is really pretty straightforward. You, have a, you add a variable for every output of your gate. And you're saying that this variable has to uh, be equal to the, the value of the, the appropriate function. Um, then I have you know, terms that hard code x the bits, input bits of x, uh, the y's are, are variable, and then I have a term at the end that says the clause has to output one. Okay, so going from circuit to Boolean formula is actually a natural step. Um, really the hard part is going to, from the Turing machine. So the whole, you know, uh, hard work of the Cook leaven was taking the Turing machine and translating that into a Boolean expression. So let's revisit that. Okay, so here's my addition of NP again. We have this polynomial time algorithm A. I was using the circuit model before, but I've changed my mind. I'm going to use a Turing machine instead. Okay? It's still a polynomial time algorithm. Okay? So this will be more instructive to us in terms of uh, constructing the QMA completeness result. Okay, so I want to know is X and L. And so now what I'm asking is I have this Turing machine M um, that's my verifier. It gets its input in X and a Y and it accepts or rejects. I want to know, is there a Y that causes this Turing machine to accept? And I'm going to translate that into a Boolean formula so that the Boolean formula is satisfiable if and only if there's a Y that causes the Turing machine to accept. Okay? That's our agenda. Um, and the Cook-Levin reduction makes use of what we call a tableau, which shows the entire history of this Turing machine computation. Okay, so each row is a moment, is a step of my Turing machine. So I can imagine encoding each configure of my Turing machine in a set of squares. The square holds either a symbol of my Turing machine tape or it holds a symbol and a state. Okay, so there are sort of a finite number of symbols and I'm a uh, finite set of symbols and I'm filling in the table to represent exactly the configuration of the Turing machine at each point in time. So at the beginning, I started at x0, the head is at the way left location of the tape, and my input is written across the tape. And in each step, as I go downward, time is progressing downward, I execute one step of the Turing machine and update it. Okay? So this whole tableau represents the entire history of the Turing machine computation. Okay? The height is the running time, the width is at most the space, which is upper bounded also by the running time. Okay? And the beautiful insight is that we can check locally that the tableau is valid by looking at only small neighborhoods of squares. So in order to determine what this square should be, I only need to look at the three above it. So certainly ones that don't include the head of the Turing machine, I'm just copying the tape cell. Um, and if the, the head of the Turing machine is nearby, it may move left or it may move right. But the point is I only need to look at local neighborhoods of my tableau to verify that the whole thing is computing as it should be, okay? Well, uh, we can compute this local check into a Boolean circuit, okay? So each, I'm encoding each possible square contents um, using a set of uh, binary inputs, okay? And I'm computing a binary output. So this function that takes in three squares and outputs the valid square contents can be encoded in binary and written into a binary circuit. Everything's finite, the tape uh, alphabet is finite, the state set is finite, the rules are finite. So this is all just a finite little gadget that does this computation for me. I'm just encoding it in binary instead of in the language of the tape cells, okay? All right, so if I put this all together, <coughs> so each of these circuits can then be computed to a Boolean formula, that's the easy part. So if I look at this tableau, I can replace each one of these squares with a copy of this little gadget. And lo and behold, I have a circuit that's computing the output of my Turing machine. 
And then I can add a little piece of logic at the end that says, OK, did I end up in an accepting configuration or not? <coughs> OK? Um, and there it is. So the output 1, if and, of, if and only if the cell contains Q of set. Q of set. So this is a, a large circuit that basically simulates the computation of a Turing machine. And so what are the features that we're going to keep when we go to the QMA completeness result? So we're going to hard code x into the, the circuit. Okay. Um, the input y will be variable. This will be quantum now instead of classical. This is really the most important one. I'm, I'm going to create a set of constraints. And if they're satisfied, then this state will represent the entire history of a computation, not just the output, but every step of the way. Okay. Sandy, what, is, what are the number of variables that you used in, in the Boolean formula? This guy here? In the entire Boolean formula. Oh, uh -oh. then the number, okay, so the number of inputs to one of these guys is log the number of tape symbols I can possibly have because I'm encoding it in binary. Um, let me go back. So each one of these is constant size, OK? Um, and then I have the size of this tableau is the running time by the running time. So it's the running time squared times this constant size gadget. So it's a polynomial size circuit. And then we'll also have the additional term to, accept, to test for acceptance. And like I said, this is really the kind of critical piece. We're going we're gonna to create a set of constraints that ensure that if those constraints are satisfied, then the state represents a history of the computation. Can we do an example of how this Turing machine, I mean, of this diagram that you put for the Turing machine? Wow, that's a lot of it. We, we usually abstract that away. <laughs> we don't we usually. We never did that. <laughs> we we d usually don't dirty our hands with that kind of detail. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, he, so he asked if I could do an example of a Turing machine. Exactly what the, like, the uh, so, I mean, each, so the Turing machine, it's, it's a function from, you know, a particular state, a particular tape contents, and the output is I might change the location, the, what's written on the tape, and move the head left or right. So it's a finite function. And all I'm saying is that I can encode that function. It's a finite function. I can encode it as a Boolean circuit. We usually don't go farther than that. Because <laughs> 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 so. every computation oh, oh. step at most 10 bits of the memory change. Yeah. All right. Maybe Sorry. you can do it offline. It's yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> OK, so here's a, a picture of our tableau. Um, uh, each row is a configuration, and this state is representing the entire history. Now, what would this look like in the quantum world? OK, here's my verification circuit. It's composed of a bunch of gates that I'm uh, executing in sequence. OK, so my initial state is just the input x and the witness. I could have some ancilla qubits with my, with my circuit. Just think of them as there. It just made the notation too messy otherwise. So there, you know, I could have a, a zero and a bunch of ancillas there as well. Okay. Um, now I execute one gate. Here's my state. Now I execute the next gate. Here's my state. And I keep going until I get to the end. And this is the final state of the, the quantum circuit. Okay. So. I want a state that encodes all of this information, the entire history. Okay? We're going to encode it in quantum superposition, but we can't do it directly. Because if I take these states and put them in quantum superposition, I could get weird interference between these states. So there could be like a, a positive amplitude here that cancels with a negative amplitude here, and I'll lose some of the information. And we really want to have the information about the entire every step of the way and not have kind of weird cancellations happen. OK, so how do we deal with that? Um, so the idea is to store the history state in computation and superposition. So what I'm going to do is introduce an additional register 
that acts as my clock. Okay? And each of these states of the computation along the way is going to be entangled or uh, tensored with um, the corresponding clock state. And so now I can't have interference happening between these two states because each of them is entangled with different clock states. So it's going to prevent that, that negative interference from happening. Um, and so what we're going to do, the goal that we're going to try and accomplish, is to create a Hamiltonian whose ground state corresponds to this history state. So let's just take a look at what it is, and that's actually a, a reasonable place to break, um, is what we're, we're looking for in our ground state is for it to be a superposition <coughs> over these t plus 1 different states. So it's going to be a uniform superposition. Each one of these states is the state of the computation at time t tensored with the clock indicating that it's time t. So that's our goal for next time. All right? Can I? Thank you. Um, any particular reason why you want like to store them in superposition, not in any other shape? Well, I don't. W at the end of the day, what I want um, is I want to be able to access the final state of the Turing machine, okay? Um, and I don't want that state to have interfered with anything else. I want that state, you know, the entire information encoded in that state. So I don't want it to be sort of uh, have lost some information by some superposition with some other state. Why not, for example, store them one like, sequence? Yeah. Um, oh, so actually have them in different, in different locations. Um, well. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. There's, so, so the classical way of looking at it is basically you can look at the configuration at time one, configuration at time two, configuration time three, etc. And each one of these configurations get, gets its own variables, and then the constraints, the Boolean formula, requires consistency between configuration at time t and configuration at time t plus 1 over all the t's, plus constraints at time 0 that the input is correct, and the constraint at time, the final time step that the output is accepted. Quantumly, the natural, the natural thing to do would have been to have a, a Hamiltonian whose ground state is sort of a tensor product of the state at time zero, the state at time one, the state at time two, et cetera. So a qubit for, so a set of qubits, a set of n qubits for each time step. And then having constraints checking locally that the state at time t evolved correctly to the state at time t plus one. This is impossible to do because even if at time t the circuit is applying a, an identity gate, um, what you have to do is to check locally that the state at time t is the same as time t plus 1. You have two states, alpha and beta, and you want to check locally that they're the same. But two states could be very, very different, orthogonal in fact, and have the same local reduced density matrices. Like for example, the cat state with a plus minus sign and with a minus sign are the same, are, are the same locally, the reduced density matrices are equal. They're just the identity for each single qubit, or they're equal for ev every uh, k, constant k qubits, but they're orthogonal because of the minus sign. There's, it's a global entanglement thing. So that's why you need to go to superpositions. It wouldn't <coughs> also contradict no cloning? I, if you could tensor all the states together? Okay, Tzvika said the prover can do whatever it wants. It can take <laughs> many copies. I don't know. No. <laughs> but, but no, there's no, there's no connection to no cloning because uh, the prover, it actually generates the state. So you can actually copy states as much as you want if you know what state you want to but generate. But you have to check that they're correctly copied. And that's, yeah. the, that's the, th the hard part. The thing part. is that you don't believe the prover, so you, you need to add constraints that actually verify that, that the state is, is what you want. Another, is there another mic? Uh, hi. Uh, the relationship between the 
three sat and local Hamiltonian problem could be uh, genera generalized to a quantum logic, that is to say, uh, considering quantum proposition as subspaces of a Hilbert space, the whole Hilbert space as through, and the trivial Hilbert space as false in the sense of Birkhoff von Neumann. Is there uh, some generalization from Boolean logic to quantum logic in this sense? Well, in the sense that um, the Boolean case can be expressed as a special case of the Hamiltonian. So I can take your SAT problem and express it as a local Hamiltonian that has a very special form, this diagonal form that I, I said before. So in that sense, there is a correspondence because, because it is strictly a special case of the quantum local Hamiltonian problem. More questions? Um, so, what would be the constraint on the energy of this um, state? What are we checking to see, uh, like at the end? Okay, so uh, we're going to create the basically the entire contents of the second lecture is going to be oh. to create the Hamiltonian whose ground state is this. Okay, oh. <laughs> and then we're going to have to have a check that says a term that says did we accept another term that said did I encode the input correctly? Just just like the Boolean case. Okay. But the whole work of, of lecture two will be, will be just what you asked. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, I think we will end up uh, here, and uh, we thank uh, Sandy again. <laughs> and we start